Well, I want to welcome everyone to Arizona State Museum's Zoomed Wrapped in Color talk series. I'm Lisa Falk, Head of Community Engagement for the museum, and I serve as your host for this evening. As most of you know, Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona, located in Tucson. We are situated on the land that has been stored at by and home to indigenous peoples for 13,000 years. And today, Tucson is home, the Tucson area is home to the Atum and Pasco Yaqui. There are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous people of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. And we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. This year's Zoom talks are in association with our exhibit, Wrapped in Color, Legacies of the Mexican Serape. Tonight's talk focuses on researching and caring for hand-woven blankets and rugs with Dr. Ann Hedlund and Dr. Nancy Odegaard. So Dr. Ann Lane Hedlund served as the museum curator and professor of anthropology at the Arizona State Museum, where she also directed the Gloria F. Ross Center for Tapestry Studies from 1997 to 2013. Her books include Gloria F. Ross and Modern Tapestry and Navajo Weaving in the Late 20th Century, plus many catalog and journal articles. Anne edited Joe Ben Wheat's prize-winning volume, Blanket Weaving in the Southwest, which was published by the University of Arizona Press. Anne now lives in Silver City, New Mexico, where she continues to write and conduct collaborative projects. She'll be joined tonight by Dr. Nancy Odegaard, who, is, who served as conservator and head of the preservation division at the Arizona State Museum, as well as professor of anthropology, material science and engineering, historic preservation, and American Indian studies at the University of Arizona from 1983 to 2021. She just recently retired. Um, and while she was here, we had to share her with a lot of people. Um, she initiated and directed the Pottery Project and the Basketry Vault Project at ASM. She's received resident scholar awards from the Fulbright Commission, Getty Conservation Institute, Withertor Museum, ICCROM, Canadian Con Conservation Institute, and University of London, as well as an honorary doctor of science from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Her many publications include the Karen Handling and Anthropological Collections, Materials Con Characterization Test for Objects of Art and Archaeology, Old Poisons, New Problems, a Museum Resource, Curating Human Remains, a Guide for Museums and Academic Institutions, and a Visual Dictionary of Artistic and Domestic Arts. She is currently Conservator Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona and continues to research, write, and conduct collaborative projects with museums throughout the United States, Europe, and Iraq. And I just wanna say what an honor it's been to work with both Anne and Nancy on so many projects at the Arizona State Museum. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn the platform over to Anne Hedlin and Anne, you can share your screen and it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. And, and thanks so much for everybody who's showing up. I, as I said earlier, wish we could all see your faces too. I think we're shared, yes. So first of all, thank you, Lisa Falk. Thank you, Darlene Lizaraga. Um, thanks also to Diane Didimore, Andrew Higgins, and everyone at the museum that keeps these collections and programs going. And it's great fun to share this virtual podium with Nancy Odegaard. I'm gonna start, um, I rarely start with jokes, but here's a joke. I love this New Yorker cartoon. It's not a shawl ombre, it's a hand-woven poncho. This is certainly Clint Eastwood style, right? Um, it underscores the importance of how we name things. And it points out the fact that we do call things by different names depending on our cultural, historical context and based on our individual experiences. Tonight, Nancy and I both will be talking pretty interchangeably about blankets, transitional pieces, rugs, about textiles, fabric, cloth, woven goods. Sometimes um, there'll be wearable garments that we're discussing or bedding and furnishings. Other times it'll be trade goods for functional uses, sometimes purely decorative objects, flat out gallery fine art. In honor of Porfirio Gutierrez's brilliant work showcased in Wrapped in Color, and I'm sorry, not all of you will be able to see this exhibition in person, but I'll show a few pieces. 
uh, tonight. Um, in honor of this show, I will be addressing four major cultural areas that have had rich textile production. Each of these includes many subcultures, many varieties. Uh, the blanket that I'm showing you right now is from the University of Colorado Museum, and it shows traits actually of all four societies. And by the end of the session today, I'm hoping that you will see which characteristics help us determine what is the probable origin of this particular blanket. So we'll come back to this. Suffice it for now to say that this is our mystery. Think about it as we go along. So the first point that I wanna make this evening um, about weavers in the Southwest, and here you're seeing entirely Navajo weavers, but indeed I would include Spanish American, um, Mexican Pueblo weavers in this also, variety. When Nancy and I were prepping for this talk, um, we, we, wanted to, we, we pondered how to convey to you while we're looking right now this evening at common traits and um, a whole series of uh, diagnostics to assess a textile, when was it made, where was it made, indeed, how was it made, we're essentially developing a formula, right? But what we really would stress to you is the variability in weavers' practices. It is their innovations, their creativity, the wonderful quirkiness that informs us about weaving from past through the present. In all of my career, I have never met a weaver, nor seen an historic blanket or a contemporary rug that didn't have some intrigue for me, some aesthetic or technical element that breaks down stereotypes and preconceptions. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to assess a textile using a whole constellation of traits, not just a single element. Not a single element is gonna tell you a de definitive identity. So this prompts me to recommend that you indeed listen and watch the other videos and Zooms in this um, series, ASM's YouTube channel. There is nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth. And Porfirio, Linda, Barbara, Lisa, and Irvin are all practitioners. They have laid the groundwork for what Nancy and I will talk about tonight. Someone asked me to say a few words about my own background. How did I come to this point? Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist who works with living artists and museum collections. I will show you the arc of my career in four slides. I started as a geology major in college, but I was also a weaver and a natural dyer at that time. I rapidly discovered I was no artist, but I loved the weaving process. While weaving in Canada on a sheep farm, I learned to work with the wool. In Mexico, I lived and wove in Guanajuato and also with a Zapotec family in Oaxaca where Porfirio comes from, Teotitlan del Valle. All of this led me to classic field work with Navajo families a few years later. I was working in translation with the Diné language I was visiting many families. I was taking part in lots of activities. I worked for the Navajo Nation Museum, met more weavers, wrote a dissertation, and a bunch of articles during the 1970s and 80s. My theme throughout as I began to assess what was I learning from Navajo weavers was again about variety, about the range of motivations, techniques, materials, aesthetic, qualities, and especially um, their sense of self-determination in producing um, the work that they did. That led to a My Museum career in which I collaborated with weavers on events and demonstrations. I shared museum collections with indigenous artists, and that led to the first ever exhibitions and symposia that brought several dozen Navajo weavers together to present their own points of view and to compare their work with others. These were landmark events. No one else had, no other museum had ever brought together weavers to speak for themselves 
and to stand up for their own work. I worked with the Denver Art Museum, the Museum of Northern Arizona, the Heard Museum, the National Museum of American Indian, um, and of course, Arizona State Museum. And that led other museums to host events and carry on this work as well. And that has led to weavers and scholars curating their own exhibitions to dig deeply into museum collections as Nancy will talk about this evening and to write their own books. Barbara Ornelas, Linda Teller Pete um, have written the first book. Prior to that, there have been weavers like D.Y. Begay, um, Callie Keems, uh, others who have written articles as well. In short, over three slides, I have worked myself out of a job and I'm delighted to have done so. I now interact with weavers on Facebook and watch eagerly as they find their own avenues for expression. I applaud what is happening today. Here's our fourth slide for the arc of my career. One thread, if you will, throughout my career has been studying the technical aspects of textiles in both museums and in private collections. I was following in the footsteps of my mentor, Dr. Joe Ben Wheat in Colorado. And I was sharing um, those collections with weavers and collectors and the public. It used to be that if I wasn't in the field chasing sheep down, I was looking through a microscope. In 2003, I compiled and edited Joe's masterwork, the book that you see in the lower uh, part of this slide. Shortly after that, we developed an online database of over 1,300 Southwestern textiles um, in 52 museum collections. And I'm really pleased and very proud to say that while that um, database has been offline now for several years, we're working very hard to get it back up and running um, and I, I'm just thrilled to say that we, we expect it to be up sometime in mid-2022. So when I look at a textile, when Nancy looks at a textile, when some of you in the audience also look at textiles, how do we figure out who made it and when? Where did it come from? Um, this is a, I know this is a Navajo poncho sorape of the classic period. Um, because of the parameters that you see laid out here on the left. It helps to have a collection history as well, but sometimes collector stories go awry. Today, we won't get into the absolute individual elements that determine the identity of a blanket or rug, um, how to actually figure out the, the formula, but we will talk about what kind of elements and why they're important. If you want the details, um, read Joe's book. Look at as many textiles as you possibly can and, and dig deep into them. Nancy would caution you there. <laughs> um, dig deep carefully. And indeed, um, there are many other workshops and museum programs that will help you understand these um, elements to, to uh, understanding a textile. So we look at style. Of course, we look at the design, we look at how it's laid out, we look at the colors that are used, but that's the tip of the iceberg for understanding um, the cultural identity and dating of a textile. Um, we look at the fibers um, very closely. Um, sheep breeds changed through time, and that means the textures of the, their wool changed through time, and we can date textiles because of the change in those fibers. Um, cotton appears early, it disappears um, fairly early also in Navajo weaving, um, it reappears at different times. We look at the yarns because they may be hand spun or they may be of commercial origins even as far back as several hundred years ago. Dyes are absolutely essential to our dating of 19th century Navajo textiles and, and um, other textiles in the 19th century as well. We look at the structure, um, we look at uh, what kinds of loom was it made on? What, what kinds of uh, woven structures? Um, is it fine? Is it coarse? Um, there'll be many different details you'll see in a few minutes. And then finally, we look at the finishing techniques. As it's being finished on the loom, um, what are the ends and sides? Uh, uh, how are they finished? Um, does it have fringe? Does it have tassels? 
So we'll be coming back to all six of these parameters, but I wanted to introduce them to you in, in just a, a broad way first. And now I wanna talk a bit about each of the four textile traditions that we're featuring tonight. I wanna to remind us how fabrics epitomize who we are and how we live. When we study textiles in another society, we find windows into their worlds. And when we understand a culture better, conversely, we can turn that understanding to further identify and date and celebrate their textiles. So in Mexico, we know through illustrated manuscripts like the Codex Mendoza that you see here, executed in the mid 1500s, we see splendid garments illustrated, other textiles, basketry. We see ways in which they were worn, ways in which they were used ritually. Um, we have little material evidence from the pre-Columbian period, but backstrap weaving survives um, has survived through the centuries and certainly into the 21st century. And it provides analogs to the past. Zapotec weavers like Porfirio Gutierrez featured in the exhibition draw from these pre-Columbian um, uh, influences and sources. The Spanish of course enter Latin America in the 1500s and with them comes sheep and their wool and European style floor looms. This is Porfirio's world. Um, uh, this is a Zapotec weaver from the same village that Porfirio comes from. Um, you can see, let's see if I can, yes, I can show you an arrow. I'm hoping everybody can see that arrow. You can see that there's a beam down here around which the warps are, are bound. They come up here, under him here, back here and round around there. They pass through two harnesses here that raise and lower the threads to make a space into which he weaves. And he has a hanging beater here that allows him to um, pack the weft into place. All of these things leave signal traits that we see in the finished piece after it leaves the loom. He is um, changing his harnesses by the treadles underneath. You can see his foot is on one of them here. And um, it also gives the name of this loom, the walking loom. Um, sometimes we call it a treadle loom, floor loom, or the walking loom. Fabrics that come off of this loom are going to be longer than they are wide as they were woven. Spanish influence on indigenous culture uh, appears in many, many different ways. Um, the story of the Saltillo Sarape is told in other parts of this exhibition and in Porfirio's um, uh, presentation online. I wanted to show you a couple of quintessential Saltillo Sarapes here from Coahuila in Mexico. And it's not just the style, although the central serrate diamond the prominent vertical borders, even when they have a horizontal border as well, the side borders are separate in design and impact. And then the many different filler motifs that you see in these two pieces. This one has little tiny dots on the right um, as well as the one on the left. These are signal traits of the Saltillo Sarape coming out of um, Mexico starting Oh, I shouldn't dig myself into a hole here right now, but um, starting centuries ago, let's, let's gloss it with that real quickly. Um, that narrower um, format, this one actually you can see has a seam down the middle. It was woven in two narrow, completely matching panels and sewn together. The ends were cut from the loom, which means the warps were um, cut and not looped. They were left as a fringe originally and then sewn into a tightly knotted edging. Later we'll see fringes evolve from the edge ends as well. But here you see um, this very famous format of saltillo, which you're gonna see in the other, borrowed by other um, 
groups as well. I wanted you to see one close-up view of a Saltillo Serape and see the fine, fine work um, that is uh, a trademark, again, of these wonderful Serapes. Here's some of Porfirio's work, and you see he, as he would say, riffs on the theme of Saltillos. He takes individual motifs, he takes a layout, he takes a, um, I can't say framework here, sometimes he does take a framework, and uh, it's evolved into some. Moving rapidly into the American Southwest, since prehistoric times, Pueblo people farmed the dry lands. Um, they raised food crops and cotton. They're known for their elaborate fiber production and um, from native agaves and yucca and other plants. Um, they made multi-purpose cordage, sandals, garments, furnishings. At about 900 AD, we know that cotton and indigo dye and loom technology that was very similar in the pre-Columbian Mexican um, traditions had moved north and was introduced into, uh, by Puebloan relatives um, from Mexico into um, the Pueblo Southwest. Men religious societies inside community kivas and followed specific requirements for the garments. They were worn for ceremonial, excuse me, ceremonial use even after the advent of commercial cloth and clothing um, for everyday use. When sheep came into the Southwest with Juan de Oñate, 1598, Pueblo craftsmen adopted wool for embroidery. And you see a manta here in the lower left that is, is both brocaded, woven brocading and embroidered for utilitarian blankets as well and for um, very refined garments. And you see a woman's manta being woven on the lower right in this 1901 photograph. Unfortunately, that photograph has been colorized and someone uh, painted red stripes into a very classic blue and black woman's manta. But here you see the upright loom that we're gonna be seeing all evening. Um, this piece is looking almost square, but it is indeed a little bit wider than it is long, as you see the um, manta on the left as well. Cotton continued to be a mainstay in ceremonial weaving throughout this time. Here you see a Hopi man's plaid blanket, which shows off a very distinctive style. This unique rhythm in the plaid is something characteristic to these blankets. You will see Spanish American herga woven with the same kind of checkered pattern, but never with this kind of um, really unique rhythm to it. On the other hand, while the design is unique, in common with other Hopi garments and, and fabrics, the fibers are hand spun, undyed wool, sometimes with cotton as well in this kind of work. The structure is woven wider than long, as I've mentioned already. It has twined side and end cords and quite prominent tassels. I want you to notice also that it has tassels sort of at the midpoint of the um, piece. And that's where the weaver had woven from the bottom to that point and then removed the web from the loom, turned it around and started weaving again from the bottom to meet at this near midpoint. And that's why those tassels are um, uh, extend from that joining part where it just right where it meets. Now we've been looking at four selvage fabrics where the warp is continuous, the warp is uncut in Pueblo weaving, woven on that upright loom. Um, I think I can go backwards and show you, yes, um, that his warp here in the lower right is bound to a beam on the top and the bottom, and the weaving is finished completely on all four edges. And most people believe, or, or it's commonly understood, that both Pueblo and Navajo weaving never have fringes. But I want to show you those exceptions, those quirky 
um, differences as well tonight. So Zuni weavers um, did indeed leave a fringe on, on uh, some of the blankets that we have surviving from the 19th century. Um, and yet, if you look closely, these warp ends are not cut. They loop back on themselves. They are continuous. They are warps extending from the web of the fabric and then returning back into the fabric. There is a closely twined selvage edge here that keeps everything together as well. So while Zunis are the exception um, that breaks the rule of no fringe on Pueblo fabrics, um, here is an example of um, uh, a part of that tradition. Now with Navajo uh, people, with their Athabascan roots and a language stock shared with peoples in present-day Alaska and the Yukon, Navajo's identity is still very deeply rooted in the Southwest. Navajo and Pueblo people both use that upright loom that I showed you a minute ago, and you see it, of course, here as well, known from ancient times. Navajo people moved it outdoors and into secular spaces, not weaving in the kivas. In the Dinet tradition, women were the weavers and still are the predominant weavers, although we have known of men um, weaving since the 19th century. And now there is quite a continuation of that trend. There are many male weavers in Navajo country. I um, took the photograph on the right, totally un. Uh, aware of the wonderful postcard you see on the left. And it was only just very recently that I paired these two things. And, and I was uh, quite surprised, quite taken by the similarity between them um, with that great time span. Um, some things change, some things don't. Elsie Wilson on the right is working on a, a welded metal frame loom with a uh, beam that rotates at the top and at the bottom to accommodate her large rugs. Here you see a rather different um, uh, and more traditional loom woven by L of Ganado. Weaving took place in individual homes and also fit into the Diné round of household uh, maintenance, child rearing, field tending, and flock herding activities. Traditionally, weaving was every woman's responsibility without a lot of specialization in Navajo country. They wove garments for local use, but also for trade to Native American groups. And then when Anglo-Americans arrived in the Southwest, they swiftly made the transition to creating rugs for sale as well. Here you see a transitional chief's blanket that is not a garment. It is based on a design that came from a garment. Um, and we know uh, we can identify it, both its style, its wool fibers, its hand spun yarns, its synthetic dyes, its wider than long structure, its four selvage cords binding all the edges. And what I want you to notice here too is the slight coloration differences in various places along here and here and here. Um, all of these diagonal lines are known now as weaver's lines. They were at one time termed lazy lines, which they are anything but. Um, they represent a way in which the weaver accommodated a wide width on the loom, working in one area at a time and then moving over and working in an adjacent area. Uh, they provide in many tapestry bridge, a construction bridge, um, they allow the weaving to relax at those points, but they also allowed the weaver to focus on a very um, intricate area of design, like these stepped uh, diamonds and triangles, and then to move over and focus on another area separately without creating a slot or a slit in the middle of the piece. Here you see a close-up of the
sometimes almost completely invisible here. These are a signature of Navajo weaving. It doesn't appear in all Navajo weaving, but when it does appear, we strongly suspect, suspect that the Southwest textile is indeed Navajo in origin. There are a few Zuni blankets that do contain uh, weaver's lines as well. So they muddy the waters and back to the fact that we have to pull many different traits together. If they have a fringe, like I showed you on that one Zuni blanket, and they have the weaver's lines, we, we begin to assess that it might be Zuni rather than Navajo. Side selvages are extremely important in our diagnostic um, toolkit. Navajo and Pueblo weaving often have twined selvages, as you see here on the right-hand side. This contemporary rug has three-strand twining. Each one of those strands, and the, the clever thing here is that they're red, white, and blue, so you can count them. They're very easy. Sometimes if they're all one color, they're difficult to tell whether it's two, three, or four strands. Um, but each of those strands is two-ply. As a diagnostic, this is one of the unusual features in historic Navajo textiles, but fairly common in very finely woven, well-woven Navajo rugs of the later period. Typically, Navajo rugs are two-strand twining of two-ply or two-strand twining of three-ply. Pueblo people reverse that. And I'll be showing you a chart of all of this later, but I want to get the concept across to you right now that this is the kind of woven in feature that we use as a diagnostic. On the left, you see a Rio Grande blanket where the um, warps on the edge have been paired inside the final um, weft passages and then um, single from then on. But you also see that these warps are plied yarns rather than single yarns. And both of those um, indicate a Rio Grande and often a Chimayo uh, woven piece. Now I've made the point that most Pueblo and Navajo pieces do not have fringes, except in the Zuni case, and also except in the Navajo case where a single saddle blanket like this has the fringes extending. And these are indeed warp fringes that extend um, they are twined along the bottom edge also. They have a twined cord um, uh, maintaining the, the bottom edge. And these warps also, I'm sorry, the photo is cut off there, but these warps are also looped. So this is an identical trait to that Zuni blanket. Now there are many Navajo saddle blankets, and I'm sure many of you know this, that have an augmented fringe. They've had Germantown yarns looped into the bottom edge and added as an extra fringe. They're not an extension of the warp. And indeed the, the fabric itself usually has a four complete selvages or three selvages plus one knotted selvage. I mentioned in that Hopi man's plaid blanket that um, there was a loom turn that was shown by the um, tassels extending from the midpoints. You're going to see here something that looks like tassels almost at the edges of this woman's um, dress panel, but in fact that is stitching. Um, it's a it's a, a figment of um, something else going on there. But this piece does indeed show the traits of having been turned in the loom. A weaver wove from bottom to part way up and turned it around. But not only did she do that so that she could reach the um, the working edge of her, her work, um, but she stitched this piece down to the bottom edge of her loom in order to reach higher. And on the left, you see L of Ganado here. Um, notice that this rug had a central diamond, very large central diamond, and you don't see all of it. It is hidden because she has completed a major portion of this rug, and then she is stitched that fabric to her lower beam in order to work at a level where she doesn't have to be sitting on top of her kitchen table on top of a, a chair. Um, instead, she is indeed um, advancing toward the top. She will stitch this down one more time. Those stitch down lines are typical of a 19th century trait, early 20th, this is 1915, this photo was taken, um, but they don't occur 
much after the 1920s. In these historic pieces in which they appear, the warps have been picked out of the fabric slightly by the tension of the stitching. And those warps never let that um, um, tension go. They always will be there. Um, Nancy can tell you that people have tried to make them disappear at times and it's a bad, uh, bad way to handle a fabric. Um, so um, loom turns and stitch down lines, again, uh, teaches something about this upright loom and the tradition from which these fabrics come. Corner finishes are also an especially telling set of traits. Um, I've shown you many pieces already that have tassels extending from them, and they may be very tight or they may be very loose. Um, we know that Navajo corners are typically very tight in their construction, whereas Pueblo, um, these are all Navajo in this particular case, they come from the same Navajo blanket, obviously. Um, Pueblo weavers might knot it way an inch or two out from the corner. Um, Zuni weavers might not uh, even include a, a tassel. They, they round the corner off and they embed the, the uh, side cords into the fabric. Um, there are many ways to finish these. And Nancy will be referring to this kind of technique in order to tell when the weaver, where the weaver started and where she finished her work, she or he, in fact. Now we move to the Spanish American tradition that grows out of the Mexican European and does combine some of the indigenous um, traits as well. In the Rio Grande River Valley and in the San Luis River Valley, um, we see weaving in villages and in civic trade centers. We see um, the introduction of European style looms beginning in the 1500s. Um, and here you see Jake Trujillo um, walking his loom, um, a wonderful example. Like the Mexican floor loom weaving that I was just talking about, these are fabrics that are woven longer than wide by and large. They're often used as blankets for furnishings. You see Isabel Trujillo using a spinning wheel, which is again, a part of the European tradition, but Spanish American weavers also adapted to the hand spindles used in um, indigenous weaving. We see records of Spanish American um, men working in organized obrajes in the 19th century. We also see women and children working in individual households. And significantly, we see in uh, historic records, Navajo, Apache, and other Indian people who have joined those households as slaves at times, sometimes as servants, sometimes as marriage partners, um, also working. And it means that we see some of the um, traits of those indigenous people worked into the Spanish American blankets as well. For Hispanos, weaving was more of a specialized uh, uh, occupation than it was in the Indian societies. I mentioned in Navajo society, it was a um, very much a household, very much a, a woman's role. Um, in the Pueblos, it was in ritual circumstances that weaving took place. Two examples of Spanish American weaving in which you see the traits of the loom. Uh, and on the right, the Chimayo runner that's woven narrowly, um, longer than it is wide. And you see the warp fringes extending and cut and knotted. Um, on the left, you see a Rio Grande Vallero star in which the um, piece has also been woven in two narrow strips and seamed together. Sometimes we see in simple banded Rio Grande blankets that they've been double woven, um, woven in two layers that were both narrow, they were each narrowly woven. Um, and then the piece is folded out after it's uh, removed from the loom. So we see these floor looms and their consequences. Here you can see even more closely how that seam looks on the right-hand side here along the um, 
middle of the fabric as the pieces are joined. All of the features I've been discussing in really broad, I, I feel badly I haven't been able to detail this to you, but not in 30 minutes, thank you. Um, but all of these are detailed in Joe Ben Wheat's book and in subsequent publications by me and many others now. Um, this chart I show you not so that you study it, and indeed it goes on. Um, but because this talk will be mounted on ASM's um, YouTube channel, you can go back and look at this. Better yet, it is table one on page four of the book, so you can see these traits and how they work. Now, I made light of design at the very beginning of uh, my talk, but in fact, of course, it's hard to ignore design. We're all interested in it. It is what uh, has the biggest impact, and, and it is important as one of the diagnostic features. So here, um, you know, when Joe Ben looked at banded blankets, he tracked the rhythms of the banding and he looked at the complexity. And I love that we have his hand drawing these things out to study them and, and compare them. Um, Pueblo uh, banded blankets were very minimalist in their appearance. They were the simplest um, and the easiest to um, see just a very um, simple rhythm. Navajo blankets, whether they're banded or much more so when they have added geometric motifs, um, often emphasize the center and the corner. And they most frequently have stepped or terraced motifs. And I'm speaking here by and large about 19th century blankets, but you will see the extension of this into the 20th and 21st centuries. Spanish American blankets had more complex compound bands. They had added serrate designs, palmate designs, and things of this sort. Now, those are the basic traits, um, but of course we need to compare those with technical traits. So we look at a blanket like this, our mystery blanket that I started with this evening, um, and now I'm showing it to you in the way it was woven. I showed it to you as a construct um, sideways when I um, began to talk about the four different societies. It's not Pueblo. It is not that minimalist uh, design. It doesn't have the, the, the restrictions of religious um, uh, ritual garments and, and all of that. It has a very strong center and it has strong corners and indeed it has stepped motifs. And that might lead one, if one is looking just at design, to think about it being of Navajo origin. Um, none of the other groups that I've been talking about have this much center corner emphasis and the terrace designs. But um, Spanish American uh, weaving uses those compound bands. And indeed, we see that this, these bands have that blue, black, blue, or excuse me, brown, blue, black, brown. <laughs> um, uh, banding. Um, and if you stand away from this piece, the piece begins to look like it's a serrate design, like those saltillo diamonds, those strong diamonds. But here's where we must enter to look at individual traits. So the style, yes, step diamonds, center and corner motifs. But then it's got these piquetes, these little blips that are sending all the way across the fabric. And some of you will know those um, as Navajo because J.B. Moore uh, presented Navajo weavers in the 19 aughts with uh, designs that used those. But they're really um, a design that's based much more in Mexican and in Spanish American traditions. The fibers in this piece are a glossy churro wool. They're beautiful, um, beautiful wool. The yarns are all hand spun, but Unlike Pueblo and Navajo weaving, these yarns are all, excuse me, the, the warps are all two ply. Very unusual if it were to be a Navajo or a Pueblo piece. The wefts are all single spun. Um, they could be Pueblo, they could be Navajo, they could be um, Spanish American. The palette, as you obviously see, is very simple. It is natural sheep's wool colors. And it is that very light colored indigo rather than dark indigo 
The dark indigo we associate with Pueblo weaving, with Navajo weaving, the light indigo we associate with Spanish American weaving. Now we get to the nitty gritty of the weave and, and you can see the piece is soft. It's been pushed out of shape. Um, it's been worn in places and you can sort of see the spacing of the warps. There's six warps per inch and there are 32 wefts per inch. This is a fabric that really resembles the hand of Spanish American weaving and not of Navajo and not of Pueblo weaving. Moreover, there are no weaver's lines in this piece. It is woven straight across as though someone threw a shuttle or passed many bobbins across this um, uh, fabric. Finally, we come to the finishing techniques in which the outer warps are paired, just like I'd showed you in an earlier slide of another blanket. We can see almost even in these slides that this slide that the um, warps are cut and they're knotted into a fringe and it has no corner tassels. So using these six parameters, we would now begin to say quite safely that this is a Spanish American blanket or fresada. And from the dyes and from the um, comparison with other blankets of similar ilk, um, we would say it dates to about 1850, 1840 to 1860 probably. And chances are there were Navajo influences in this work. This very likely was a blanket in which made in a household, a Spanish household, in which there was a Navajo slave or servant um, who brought some of these um, designs and techniques. So it is a hybrid but of substantial Spanish-American origin. So I feel like I've just whizzed through this with almost no detail for you. I hope um, it has made some sense and what makes you want to look at more. Um, if you do want to look at more, I have a couple of references, resources here. Um, I will be teaching a course in just a couple of weeks or in mid-February um, in New Mexico, but by Zoom. And it's something that anyone can uh, join as a member of the Western Institute of Lifelong Learning and um, join our class. There are some marvelous Facebook groups uh, passing information around these days. And I recommend them strongly for people who are interested in hearing other people puzzle over what they have. And both of the groups, um, are looking you know, strongly at pieces and, and putting many wonderful, wonderful images online. And then someone will say, well, it has a fringe, can't be Navajo. And indeed it turns out to be Navajo. Well, it doesn't have a fringe, must be something else. Um, they're, they're, they're great groups to follow. And then finally, the Joe Ben Wheat online database will be uh, up and running, we hope sometime in this coming year. So thank you for all of that. With that, I move beyond the loom um, and we'll make a transition to Nancy talking about what happens after the piece leaves the loom and reaches collectors and museum galleries and farther horizons. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for hanging in there and staying with us. Um, Happily, this will be recorded um, in case you do have to go on. I'm Nancy Odegaard, um, recently retired from the Arizona State Museum where I was conservator and head of the preservation division. I have um, also a bit of a weaver, um, done very little, but it began when I was a child. Um, in my career as a conservator working in a museum, I tend to see textiles that have long been away from the loom that made them. Their story um, that they tell usually includes a lot of wear, maybe some abuse, uh, some fading, some infestations, and some repairs. And so I begin to look at what and how things have been going. Recently, my work has uh, been privileged to be with some professional weavers, some young and new weavers, and a variety of museum professionals where we're really trying to learn from the textile 
And I guess kind of answer that who, what, why, where, when of how the textile came together. And um, so I've been very particularly interested in where was the weaver in everything. So the talk um, I'm gonna share with you tonight will be some of the information that a team uh, that began with my team at the Arizona State Museum Conservation Lab, uh, where we were looking very closely um, at Navajo textiles. And, and um, I'm gonna echo Anne uh, in that there's a huge amount of variability. And we came to talk about the clues and not every textile has all the same clues and sometimes they're a bit contradictory but we um, go ahead and um, see what that's about and then i'll mention some things about care so i'm going to move forward and just sort of talk a little bit our team um, that we learned so much about with that barbara onelius um, betsy burr who currently works with the park service was um, a crest fellow in our lab and is also a weaver and headland who you've just heard from uh, delana joy farley a new uh, younger weaver and curator and of course myself and we were um, really looking as you saw those various looms we, what real question we had was where where did the weaver start what is the top what is the bottom what is the front and what is the back and i'll indicate that my concern had been we were receiving textiles and needing to put a catalog label on and so this became important to standardize where what was the top bottom front back and realized that with many textiles that was very difficult to tell and um, so i'm just sort of showing on the photo that here has the loom maybe more than one weaver could be weaving at a time maybe a weaver would be working in sections or in time periods and so our story on reading of any given piece has some complexity some of these pictures you'll recognize having been in there but weavers start from the bottom they move up sometimes they truly move up like the table sometimes as we saw the pictures they curl around and sometimes the textile gets flipped to complete a full piece in our study we looked at eight textiles early ones and then five uh 20th century rugs since that time i've i've been working with uh, some other collections and weavers and looking at many dozens of uh, additional textiles, all with a similar uh, idea to try to see the top, bottom, front, back. And I'm gonna share now some of the clues. Um, we came to be putting things together. This is a way of organizing our information. And I don't expect you to look at this, but you'll be able to go back and look at some of the general documentation information and then some of the orientation information that was necessary one of the things we look at first of all is the design to give us a clue um, many times there's perhaps um, a pictorial lettering or um, words that might tell us which way it was done sometimes there's um, design elements or ceremonial design motifs uh, that give us a clue. Sometimes there's a, a little line that has come to be known the weaver's pathway. And that's not always in the upper right, but often it is. And we look to see if that might be where uh, that particular indication of the low orientation is. We also, in terms of trying to understand the top and the bottom, we'll look at uh, the measurements. Um, as a weaver is proceeding with the textile, the tension often causes the, um, the warps to compress a little bit, and we'll find that the top is just a little bit narrower than the bottom. And this is a, then a clue to where the textile was started. As that happens, weavers have to solve that problem, or sometimes they solve that problem by adding uh, extra warps. And we can then see how that uh, technique 
was uh, was done. Sometimes we can also see where there's been some stretching, as you can see on the side here. When we're also another one of my favorite things to look at early on is um, Anne had mentioned the packing that's at the bottom as the compression of those early weft rows goes, it's a little tighter at the bottom and tends to be a little looser at the top. Sometimes there's some errors and a measurement of the top and the bottom is often a clue. Sometimes you can feel it, but here in this picture, you can see the 12 wefts here and um, 18 up here. Some other clues um, that help us um, are looking at when um, the tension changes. Oops, excuse me. Let's see if I can get back. Um, the um, tension causes a little bit of uneven finish at the top or the presence of knots in the broken warps where there was a problem. So those are typically on the weaver's face, the, the, the surface that the weaver saw. So giving us an idea that from what the weaver's looking at, there's a front and a back. There was that mention of the weaver's lines and here an indication, and you can maybe make them out here in the slide, there's quite a few in this area. We've kind of colored over with on the image to give us an idea. That can be, that arch can be a bit of a clue as to what is the top and bottom. We also look at the side cords and Anne talked a little bit about the, uh, the tassel in the middle and we can start to see um, where there's a bit of either an overlapping or the ends of the cords, or if those side cords uh, were woven back in, as in this example. So looking at, um, an, a, at a textile that has been turned on the loom, we're likely to, to see um, some of the information along those side cords and where the, the weaving changes. So in this case, we can, begin to see both that measurement uh, at the first bottom starting up and then turning and coming back down. And it takes a little bit to find these clues. I will mention that a textile that has been received heavy wear or has been cleaned many times or particularly with dry cleaning where there's a kind of a compression, we lose a lot of definition of these clues. This is one where that's a real example. Um, so as the weaver is weaving, the weft yarns come forward. So there's a little bit of um, sort of a, a, Barbara Nelius described it as a kind of a clarity on the backside because those yarns are pulled forward. So on the same textile pictured here, I think you can see this is a little, there's a little more clarity in the weave than there is on the, the front side. And that's really that the, those yarns coming forward. And that can give us a good idea of the front and the back as, as the weaver was working. We mentioned the, the, where the, the location of where those um, warp knots that were repaired are whether they're near the top or the bottom, but also which surface they're on um, with the front or the back. And um, this can be helpful. Finally, uh, one of the other things is uh, looking to those side cords. And we did find some um, irregularity. This doesn't always the way it goes, but with some dominance, the, um, it's common to see those side cords angling out on the front surface and would be the opposite um, on the back. So I just, uh, in the idea of putting a, a, a whole textile together, you, you're looking at an image, um, there's not so much color, um, you start to look at what are those clues. 
And um, sometimes I show this without the without the the answers, but we've looked here and we can see something a little unusual. Perhaps it's a weaver's path. We've looked at the issue of the clarity on the front and back. We've looked at the um, weaver's line and how the um, yarns are presented in there. We look at the final row and um, they're the first row and the or the last row um, and just kind of trying to look at that compactness and whether there's uh, been uh, warp repairs. So we can oftentimes put a number of clues together. We, as I said, we rarely see all of the clues in a single textile, but we start to put them together and we get an idea. I want to kind of be able to go into a little bit with care. Obviously, that's um, critically important. And we saw the slide of a contemporary home. Here's a kind of a historic picture where we have textiles located on the floor and on the furniture and on the table and on the over the window and hanging from the walls. Um, might not see that so commonly today, but. It is a decision as to where you or how you want to display a textile. And I'm going to offer a few suggestions um, hanging from for hanging or display. I would avoid an exterior wall and certainly a window um, for the for the presentation of a textile. If you're going to put um, one of these textiles on the floor, I recommend pads. And if they're on the wall, a kind of a mounting system, they're important. I'm going to go over just a little bit, uh, some thoughts on cleaning, again, abbreviated, a little bit on insects, because they are a problem for us, and um, some thoughts on storage. So uh, bear with me on the with textiles, particularly large uh, rugs that were woven to be on the floor. We often see them there, but even small ones. Um, there's a variety of products that can be used. The important thing is to use something to avoid that wear and tear, particularly on the salvage or outer edge of a textile, um, a fringe area. And I've just sort of showed some of these um, that are on floors around the various forms. Um, some are better than others, but the, my point is padding is important. In terms of hanging, um, all of these examples, I think, don't work very well. Um, obviously, nails and tape and staple guns are pretty hard on textiles. Tacking and nailing are difficult. Um, we do see the damage in museum collections from their earlier life on people's walls. The kind of sleeves that are used for quilts are usually not very good for uh, these woven textiles, um, nor are stretching on a canvas or trying to stitch all the way through. Part of this is that we're mostly talking about woolen textiles, and as they hang, they need about maybe even 48 hours to adjust to an environment that involves the gravity. So usually there's an adjustment. We tend to recommend the use of the Velcro system. Um, involves a little more work to get that on, but it allows uh, greater security for the textile and greater flexibility for uh, taking up and down or maintenance of a textile. We, I like to recommend that you use a cotton cloth, such as a muslin, that you purchase it and wash it thoroughly, uh, flatten it, and then use a sewing machine only on the Velcro. This is the soft side of the Velcro, not, not the loopy side, and not on the important textile. With this piece, you then hand stitch. And I like to recommend a random stitching pattern so that the stitches do not create a stress point in a very straight line so that the warp is stressed at the same point. So I like to see a little more randomness. These are instructions um, and comments are also in the 
document available at the Arizona State Web, uh, Museum website. Um, I can't really not talk about light damage because almost any textile that's been dyed is prone to suffering from light damage. We might see it um, very subtly or as an overall pattern. We might see it on one side and not the other side. Very often there's uh, something protecting the textile. We'll see um, damage, uh, or in this case, this is a window with, that just hit this spot. Um, so if you have textiles you care about, you have to care about light. And that's going to be your sunlight and your um, indoor lighting. Um, all of that has a factor that um, the visible light and the ultraviolet light cause problems. And if infrared, such as in sunlight, is present, the heat from that is also damaging. Um, a little bit about textile cleaning. In the museum, many of you already know, we often use a polyester window screen and vacuum through that. Best example is really looking down here in this lower photo where there is some damage that exists and it, the vacuuming through the screen allows us to get the particulates and dust, but not pull up those broken and damaged yarns or fringe pieces. There are a lot of reasons uh, when that a vacuum is not enough. There might be pet stains, there might be food stains, there might be mold, there might be tobacco, there might be unknown stains, or there could even be far, fire charring. And to address these, it's really a, a, a level of emergency, a level of degree um, as to how far to go. People do talk about water cleaning and uh, water is, is very popular for soiling. Um, in the case of dyed textiles, however, it's very important to test and doing a simple test with uh, a paper towel and a drop of water, and then kind of pinching it between your fingers gives you an idea, but that you often need to have um, well over a minute, sometimes two or three minutes to know if a dye is going to become unstable as shown here. Um, people often ask me uh, um, about um, washing and I have seen Navajo textiles that were put through a washing machine. This is a close up of one where you get a kind of a, an explosion of puffiness. So it's, I cannot think of a situation where the wa a commercial or a, a industrial washing machine would be appropriate. In a museum context, in a cons conservation lab, it would be a much more delicate process, usually involving screening and careful cleaning. This is a picture of a dry cleaning machine and uh, dry cleaning is um, popular enough and is used uh, by many homeowners and collectors where they are worried about the dyes. The one thing that you tend to be able to see with a collection of dry clean textiles is a kind of compression. And just by looking at this example here versus maybe the lower area here, you get an idea of how that dry cleaning process pulls some of the moisture in, and the pieces tend to um, feel a little flattened um, and maybe even crispy uh, to the touch. Years ago, um, Travis Lane, uh, one of my students, uh, pictured up here in not such a clear photo, um, Travis is Diné, and we were working on a project comparing uh, museum cleaning techniques and traditional techniques. And he um, uh, reminded me that, um, or told me that he remembered as a child being told never to look through the loom. Um, and wondered if there wasn't something about the idea of passing through that was inappropriate. And I thought about the techniques that I was aware of traditionally, which are more of a poulticing. And the things that I had heard about and asked about had to do with soil and snow, particularly snow from February, and cornmeal. 
And those techniques uh, involve really using those, the sand and the snow and the cornmeal to poultice or lift off soiling rather than pass through. So almost a, a complete opposite to uh, Western thoughts on washing and cleaning. And so with that, we did a series of tests and um, looked at, at how the effective that was. And in, to be honest, poulticing is quite effective for many types of um, soiling. I will mention um, insects. We've had a lot of experience, uh, almost anybody working in museums and perhaps in your home, I not found too many people that have not had an attack by clothes moths or carpet beetles. These are the few but uh, dangerous insects in the, that prefer proteinaceous material. Um, the big concern is you've got to monitor your collection. You've got to take the textile and look at the front and the back. You've got to go into where you're storing them or displaying them and look closely to check. Uh, left unattended and in a quiet, dark place, insects will do quite a bit of damage. What we see here in the middle is the webbing clothes moth and some of the damage here and the telltale holes here. What is um, the technique we use mostly is freezing. Um, and the State Museum, uh, we began doing early work on this um, back in the 80s and we're among the first museums to come up with a procedure for this. Um, we like to recommend um, a chest freezer, a bagged textile, put in a plastic bag with enough air around it, um, so not packed tightly, and into the freezer for about 48 hours, out through thawing, often the next day, and then back for a second cycle of 48 hours. Um, in my experience, a, a domestic chest freezer is adequate. And then once the textile is thawed again, it's important to um, vacuum carefully. And I wanna just say that anybody using a vacuum cleaner to um, remove insect uh, material should be very careful to empty the bag and get it out of the house if this is what you've used it for. Um, clothes moth um, is very common. It goes through a, a kind of a, a metamorphosis from an egg to a larva to a pupa and then emerges as the moth. The moth does not eat the textile, um, but the larva do. The eggs are uh, very tiny. Um, you really have to have microscope to be able to see them. The larvae are shown here, they're little worms uh, that move and devour. And when they're ready to um, go to the next stage, the pupil uh, casing, they will often camouflage that with what they're eating. And so they can, those can be hard to see, but we'll pick up the dyes and the fibers that way. The other big one is the carpet beetle. And uh, you can see it in the, in the picture here. This is the adult form, which uh, prefers pollen. So if you have flowering plants in your house, that is the type of thing they like. Their larvae, however, enjoy the proteinaceous material and um, will devour, usually got kind of by grazing along. Um, of the two, carpet beetles and clothes moths, um, in my experience, carpet beetles are a little easier to get rid of first. In both cases, you, you, if you've had an infestation, you really have to stay on it um, to be sure you're removing. I will say that in my experience, freezing does kill the eggs, the larva, and the adult. Um, people ask me about reweaving, and it certainly can be done. I think it's a question of whether it should be um, and who should do it. I know that many um, weavers are uncomfortable about having reweaving done or for them to do it. Some weavers do uh, do reweaving as another line of their, their career. Um, this is just really a decision. I think 
uh, documentation is very important if, if you do decide to have uh, reweaving of your collection done. And finally, last slide, um, I want to um, just say that rolling textiles, particularly these woven textiles, uh, prevents the creasing and um, can, be, can be useful. If you are going to roll a textile at home, you can use a cardboard tube, but please cover it with aluminum foil or mylar uh, film or uh, purchase acid-free rollers to uh, protect the textile and then cover those. So that is uh, my brief uh, and comments for, um, for care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne and Nancy. And now I'm worried about all my textiles. <laughs> so, I have um, a series of questions that have come in and I'll just walk, walk our way through it. Um, I didn't get to read the last few, but uh, it's okay. So the first ones are sort of aimed towards you, man, more, but I think whoever, um, well, the very first one is, you, you've talked about it a little bit, Nancy, is um, she said, I had a moth scare and packed my rugs away wrapped in plastic. Um, I, obviously they need to freeze it first, but is the plastic good or bad? The plastic for storage is, um, is not bad. Uh, one of the things about using plastic depends a little bit on where you live. Um, and what your ambient condition is um, at the time you're putting it in plastic. If your textile, if it's been very humid and your textile has absorbed a lot of humidity, which wool can do, putting it in the textile, putting it, sorry, in the plastic bag and containing it, if, if say going away for the summer, that can be a problem. So I would say, um, you want to try to put something in plastic, which is not a problem here. It would be in the tropics. It could be a problem in certain parts of the United States or other parts of the world where you have a lot of humidity. It works well in the Southwest. So I'm gonna to have to say it depends. Um, but if you were using uh, plastic bags, they are inherently not a problem, but the conditions that you live and the condition of the textile, the, the how much humidity it has when you bag it do make a difference. So if you live in a humid place, what should you wrap the, how should you protect the textile? I would, in a humid place, I would probably um, try to put the, the textile maybe in, in a cotton, a kind of a, a pillowcase, if you will, or into um, an acid-free box or a cedar chest or something. But again, anytime you're going to enclose something, try to put it in during the conditions where it's going to remain stable. So if it's raining outside or if something got wet, you don't want to put it inside a closed container. It needs to be dry if, that, if you're following what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to switch over to a question probably for Anne. It says, I didn't clearly understand why a weaver's line happens and what movement the weaver is making that causes them to appear. Please explain for one who knows nothing about weaving. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. I suspect, did you hear that? Thanks for that question. I suspect others might not have understood either. Um, so uh, a weaver faced with an upright loom is weaving back and forth from one selvage to the other, or uh, uh, within each uh, design area. A weaver's line is created when a weaver decides to segment her weaving. And, and I'm gonna say her, but it could be her or him, absolutely. Um, so she's weaving on one part, let's say on the right-hand part, and she makes a diagonal progression of her yarns in that section so that she can then move over to this side and she weaves on top of that diagonal line her next segment. That means that she's got two um, 
chunks of weaving that are now sitting one on top of the other, as it were, and no slit involved in the middle. If she'd just woven back and forth and back and forth and then moved over and done the same thing, she would have had a slit in the middle. As it is with a diagonal line, it's all connected. So um, the first principle of a weaver's line is that it extends the weaver's reach. She can weave a wider piece. She or he can weave a wider piece. Um, but it also allows her to focus on a design area, given design area, and then move over and focus on another fussy design area. In the process of making those kinds of diagonal joins, it does relax the fabric to some degree also. So I know, for instance, in French tapestry weaving, um, some of the, I think they're medieval, I'm not, not completely sure which period, but in any case, ancient European times, um, tapestry weavers have used those diagonals to release the tension across the fabric. It hangs better that way. So I hope that um, describes a little bit better. Now, those same structures, that diagonal line, can be a device in which tapestry weavers change their colors. So if you're weaving a triangle or a diamond or anything else on the diagonal, you can be simply creating two color areas. Uh, the trait of a weaver's line is that it takes place, and you probably saw this in my slides, it takes place specifically in an area of solid color. Right. I sort of noticed a little bit too with um, when we see some of these weaver's lines that it, there's a little bit of allowance to um, do some design adjustment that you can, uh, um, it's a little bit by inserting that they can realign if there's this, the, 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 the complete design is gonna, needs a little adjustment. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was an undergraduate working with Joe Ben Wheat, um, one of the very first projects he set me to doing was a slide projector projecting an image of a textile on the wall and a great big piece of graph paper on that wall. And I went through a given textile from the museum collection laying on the table and mapped out every lazy line in the fabric. And I did this for a dozen different pieces that Joe chose for me, different periods, different styles, you know, different regions. And he was wanting to see if those lines were prov provided some kind of pro progression to the weaving. Did they um, uh, break up the space in meaningful ways aside from the color changes that the weaver was making? And in the end, we decided, no, they really didn't um, form a unique pattern, except to allow a weaver to focus on particular design areas. But they didn't pr provide their own design, is what I'm saying. Right. <clears throat> that makes sense. And back to Nancy's premise of our question of what is the sequence in which a weaver makes her work? Um, the lazy lines really do provide, you can, you can see, um, you don't weave them upside down. They, 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 they do provide a direction to the, the weaving in many ways. And you can really retrace the, the hand of the weaver by following the lazy lines in a piece. Yeah, just so all of the details just start to reveal a story. It's, um, you, it puts you in the, the position of where the weaver was progressing and solving problems. And I, I come to really appreciate that weavers, um, as they're creating, um, are incredible problem solvers. <laughs> That's so true. I've, I've seen Barbara fix many of the beginning weavers work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Understanding of those problems by a master. Um, I would like to ask a few more weaving questions before we move on. And then there's quite a bit about stuff that Nancy addressed. Um, one is, what are the methods to maintain balance when two panels will be joined? And does the weaver count the rows of weaving or estimate the number of rows or use a measuring device? 
So I assume that person is asking about the Spanish American or the Mexican textiles that are right. woven as two strips. Right. And boy, my initial answer is I wish we knew. I would love to be a mouse in a corner of those weavers, floor loom weavers, to see just how they gauge um, one panel against the other. Um, surely there has to be some counting, some measuring, some eyeballing, all of those three things combined. Um, but I've never understood quite how the best weavers can make those almost perfectly matched. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you from Navajo perspective, they're not trying to match that, but they're doing all kinds of other things. Um, it's in the eye. It's not in the counting. It's not in measuring for Navajo weavers that I know. Um, it is in their sensibility for the texture and the depth of packing that they're doing and the tension of the warp. And um, it's, it's really um, a set of perceptions rather than measurements. Um, yeah. I noticed. I don't think that's true with you know, those panels. And it, looking at the ones in the exhibit, some of the oldest ones that are from, you know, maybe prior to 1800, um, they're, they're not exact. If you, yeah. you know, if you stand from afar, they look it, but when you get up close, you can see they're not at all exact. Yeah, that's now, in, in working on mounting those the textiles that are in the exhibit. Um, I worked on several of those, and they're definitely um, very rarely are, are they perfect. Yeah. And that seems to be okay because you really got such a, a an prominent center and a lot of information, a lot of design features that you don't actually have to have it perfect, and it still works quite well. I was wondering, Anne Nancy. Um, it, to, it, it seems like the older textiles are pieced together in the two panels. Are weavers, more contemporary weavers, making wider, do they have wider looms or are they still stitching them together? Or uh, somebody mentioned something about having two warps so that they can weave on the opposite side and then open it up. And how does that work? And do they have to be pushed together or for the ten? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think all of those things, Lisa. Um, <laughs> uh, I am not aware of any weaver making those two panel fabrics any longer. Okay. Um, I'm curious whether there might be someone that's escaped me who's doing it as an experiment or as a reenactment and, and to see how it's done. I wouldn't put it past Irvin and Lisa Trujillo, for instance or Porfirio. Um, and it, it may have been in their talk that they mentioned it, but I heard but I'm not aware of that. Um, yeah. Irvin mentioned, and then again tonight, I did mention the double woven fabrics. Mm -hmm. And this is a case where um, you can have two sets of warps and you can weave across one set of fabric and weave one set here. And if you're clever and you do that and continue the weft right here, between those two layers. Then on the loom, it's narrow, but two layers. It's folded out when it comes off the loom. And right in the middle is usually where there is a set of paired warps, just like there were paired warps on the edges of the other um, fabrics that I showed you. And would have been. And is there a little bit of a gap there that needs to be sort of pushed Sometimes, together? Yeah, there's a change of texture. There's, there is a. Um, something that lets you know that that's happened. I don't think there's any um, fabrics that I'm aware of that would have escaped detection that way. Nancy, do you know but if any in the exhibit are that way? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think any that I can recall are woven that with that clear. double like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was curious about that. Um, Sticking with one last weaving question for now, might come back to some, but um, what's the function of the weaver's path that you pointed out in, in, for top and bottom, uh, Nancy, but that you know you see in some of your pictures? Well, I've been in some discussions about that. And um, sometimes people feel that it's important to have a way out. People might recall a, a Navajo wedding basket that has a pathway out from the inside to the outside and that 
um, it's important to have that something. And these sort of gaps or lines or separations that are from the edge of the textile into the center, particularly on a bordered textile, um, seem to not necessarily be in the same place, but they might appear, or there might be some variation in the stitching that's clearly intentional um, that might mean something like that. But I didn't, I, I can't say I've had a, a, a consistent um, answer that that is what that is, or that that certainly is not done by all weavers. You won't find that on every, on every textile blanket or rug. Um, but so I can add a little to that because um, I did some research on that subject in the field um, a number of decades ago. First of all, in traditional Navajo society, there is a particular dislike of being enclosed, being trapped. Um, and that um, principle extends to weaving where when in the late 19th century Navajo weavers began to be aware of bordered rugs, borders on rugs, um, particularly in oriental carpets and things of that sort, they adapted that and they were asked by traders to adopt it and created borders around their rugs. And um, one way to avoid being trapped inside one's rug, and that's a word, those are words that I've heard Navajo weavers use, is to add a simple line moving from the inner panel of the rug design to the outer edge of the border. I did a whole series of interviews with weavers, Navajo weavers exclusively, and it was wonderful fun. I got I, it started actually with a project very much like yours, Nancy. We needed to know how to hang the um, rugs in a show at the Denver Art Museum. And I was aware of the Weaver's Pathway, and I was aware that we had rugs with one and also rugs with two Weaver's Pathways on opposite corners, upper corners. Um, and so I started talking to Weaver's about it. And um, there were many weavers then in the late 1980s uh, who said, don't weave it. I don't need to. I weave banded rugs. I, um, I don't follow my mother or my grandmother's edicts. I don't use them. Um, there were quite a number of weavers who said, I use them when I put a lot of thought into my rug, a lot of effort. And then I don't use it for some time. I take a break but I use it when I feel like I need to. And there are some weavers that said, I use it every time it is my release. Weaving is hard work. I put myself into it and I have to let myself out of it. Mm. Now, the story keeps going on. I, this is a long story, but um, there were weavers that said, oh, um, I put it in because it sells better. It gives the trader a better story to tell about the rug. And they were not being um, you know, frivolous about that, but they knew it as part of Navajo tradition. It had left the family, but they were coming back to it um, because it was part of storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think now, uh, it, back, it, it, uh, these examples play out the sense that there is absolutely amazing variability in Navajo weavers intentions and motivations and everything else. Um, I do think there is a renewal of the interest in that spirit line now um, because of its spirituality, because of what it means to young Navajo weavers to be part of Navajo culture and part of uh, a, a very long tradition. And for that reason. Thanks. Um, there, there were a couple more questions related to something you were talking about. Um, dealing with the weaver's lines, just real quickly, if we can, I'll cover those. Um, Ann Russell was wondering if the weaver's lines were more common in 19th century weaving? No, because they weren't bordered rugs in the 19th century. Um, it, it, not not the spirit line, I don't think. Not I think. the weaver's oh, line. Weaver's line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Yes, they're in the older, older ones where the 
um, yeah. Where so, the, so and, and so they can be used to estimate how old the piece is. You no, think? no. Well, it adds to the traits, but it's um, yeah. I would put it in the the clues. <laughs> they, these are these are traits or as Anne says or, or sort of clues. There, you you look for you need many forms of information to start to really label something. And this is one of those things that became less common, surely. Um, and we see more of them in those 19th century yeah. examples. But um, what we find in the early 20th century is traders are discouraging using those lines um, because they were seen as a flaw and not an intentional flaw. That's another story completely. Mm -hmm but um, they were simply seen as a d visual distraction. And um, I, again, another small research project that I undertook was to look at what weavers in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, 1980s, um, were doing instead. And there are alternatives to using a weaver's line um, in order to still segment your weaving, focus on finicky areas and um, release that tension. So um, it could, but also, visible. you know, this, the idea of having to make these gigantic uh, textiles um, at the last, the last century, early part of the last century for these, for probably for hotels and ballrooms and train stations and so on, um, that one solution is to make a smaller textile. You don't <laughs> need to do that. And in fact, um, I think there is a size, the, the size becomes smaller, um, not completely, but um, most people don't have a 30 foot uh, woven Navajo textile at home anymore. Yeah. And there are ingenious ways to do those larger textiles. Yeah. And you mentioned researching for how to hang some textiles. And there's a question related to that. It says, in, mu in museums, I've observed Navajo blankets displayed in both horizontal and vertical orientations without regard for the direction that the blanket would be worn, or I should, could say woven. Um, is the later, you know, which, which orientation is preferred? Either Anne or Nancy can answer this question. So. Um, well, the, the design, if, if the design clearly shows say figures uh, or vehicles or you know some kind of scenery that puts it the other way that was the weaver's intent uh, to to have it that way um, when there is nothing like that it is easier it is it is stronger for the textile to hang with the warps in vertical mm -hmm. format but I will say that from an anthropological perspective or technological, um, unless the design proves otherwise, um, not only is it stronger to hang vertically, but I like to hang it the way it was woven. Exactly. Um, I um, especially like to publish my illustrations in the, the, the fashion in which they were woven so that you just know it's, it's, it's a, What's it called? A um, not a tradition, but a a standard in textile scholarship to to show the textile in the manner it was woven, unless there's some other um, feature that contradicts that. Oh, are all chiefs? Oh, like but let me say, than, yeah. Uh, the, the question was interesting because she said worn, not woven. Right. And you know we. Um, Gosh, the National Museum of the American Indian did a fabulous exhibition some years ago, 1992 or so, um, when they showed the textiles as worn and they used Navajo consultants to model them and to experiment with how they were done and to look into historic photographs to really um, represent them as they were worn. And that was brilliant to see them in three dimensions that way is wonderful if you can do it in conservation minded ways. But hanging on a wall, we very often, if you're hanging a serape or a poncho and you do it vertically, it's gonna be 90 degrees to the way in which it was worn. If you're hanging a chief's blanket, which is wider than long, 
you're showing it the way it would have been worn. You can kind of imagine it being wrapped around someone's shoulder then. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I have one that's very different. Um, <laughs> One person said, I saw a photo of a spinning wheel in Arizona made with a bicycle wheel. Is this rare or is this kind of innovation more common? <laughs> hmm. I know of a wonderful, I have photographs also of a wonderful spinning, not wheel, but spinning uh, using skateboard wheels to mm. drive the mechanism. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's um, unique but it's certainly an innovation. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Nancy, I think this one goes to you. It's about hanging textiles. Uh -huh. We were taught to hang the weaving directly to the loopy side of the Velcro. We have blue stick Velcro, then to an oak slat, which we put the weaving onto the Velcro. Hanging the slat to the wall without any attachment to the weaving. We hang the warp vertical flipping once a year. Your comments are appreciated. Okay, well, it sounds, yeah, you would put the soft Velcro side on the textile, um, hand stitching that. If you put the textile directly on the looping, you're likely to get a little felting or pilling of your weave because that every time you take it off and put it on, it's gonna pull at those yarns. So you would expect to see uh, much like the way a, a cat scratches or something that 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 looped pulling will will be visible um, over time on your textile. So I prefer to see the soft Velcro side stitched to a muslin and that muslin uh, or cotton uh, textile hand stitched to the handwoven textile so that if you could in fact have a piece of Velcro at both ends and then flip that um, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. But putting the Velcro, the loopy Velcro directly to your textile will, will cause a little bit of felting of that woven surface. And while we're talking about Velcro, somebody wanted to know about she said, what do you think about hanging a textile using Velcro with the adhesive strip, I guess, directly to the wall? It really depends about the weight, um, which also determines the width of the Velcro that you want to use. So a very um, lightweight textile doesn't need as much Velcro or strength, but um, a textile with some real weight to it um, I would be worried about the just the adhesive being strong enough and would probably adhere it to a piece of wood uh, that can be then fixed to the wall. And somebody else was wondering about hanging them using carpet tacking strips. That was a kind of a common idea and it, it's a little bit like that pulling in that um, because it's it's unlike a carpet that has a backing of burlap or some kind of um, maybe adhesive that's holding carpet, commercial carpet down. Your hand woven textile, if it goes on the carpet tacking material is going to pull. The tack has a very rough surface and a sharp point. And that in and out on the, with your, your hand woven textile is gonna cause damage. Um, and because it's going to pull at those warps and that you've already potentially at one end have a little bit more weakness there anyway. Um, so I, I don't think those are, are you, there's, I can't think of a time when that's really a good, a good option. Is those the same reasoning why you wouldn't use like how you hang a quilt? Yeah, one of the things with the quilt sleeve or loop is that you're, you're gonna be attaching and that, that point of contact is going to be right at the same part of the warp going across. So you'll have two weak lines, two parallel lines of weak of warp. And because of the tension changes in a hand woven 
textile, that draping is going to happen. Uh, that's going to make it basically have folds and undulations after it's hung. With the Velcro, you can adjust for that. With the sleeve, you just have to live with it. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple about screens. One was asking, and I'm not sure, I don't remember what the screen was, but it says, what type of screen do you use? And another person asked where they can obtain a polyester screen. They're not having much luck via internet searches. Okay, so it's possible to use very, uh, you could use nylon tool from a fabric store. The, the polyester screening is available at a hardware store. It's what people use to repair screen doors and windows. And you can typically buy it on a roll or by the yard. We purchased that because it's uh, smooth and will lay flat. The modification we do because we use these a lot, is to get a bias tape and, hand, and stitch that around the edge so it doesn't have just the cut edge. But the, the material itself comes from a, a hardware store. Okay, couple more hanging questions. What do you think about clamp type hangers? That's a very temporary situation where you're trying to sort of see again, Anytime you are focusing pressure and tension on something that has weight and is gonna be coping with gravity, you're, you're focusing that. So you run the risk of the clamp actually creating a distortion for how the textile hangs. And you can't really recover that um, easily. So we try to distribute the stress evenly across the warps in including the wefts, knowing that there is some tension change that might be going on there. But if we, if we don't distribute the stress, if we focus it with a particular clamp or hanger, we'll, we're likely to see that distortion become permanent. And the answer to this one might be similar. It says on hanging, what is flipping for? Flipping is to, again, um, uh, when, when people do that is to not keep the gravity flowing the same way all the time. I don't know how often that's really necessary. And again, that kind of depends on the weight and the condition. Um, in a museum display, we're often asked to compromise how something is hung based on the condition of the ends and the straight line that it has. So a, an undulating end uh, that might have been the finish of a textile looks a little unusual uh, in display. All right, we feel our viewers like to see sort of straight lines. So we tend to put the problems hanging down where they're a little less visible uh, when you just walk into the room. Um, the really important thing, more important to my thinking in terms of flipping the top the top, top and bottom or the front and back is really monitoring and checking to make sure that issues of dust, uh, lint, um, sunlight or insect infestation are not mm -hmm. having an effect. Um, so it's, it's, it's monitoring those conditions um, is the reason to take down and look carefully at all edges of your, all sides of your textile. Nancy, I remember quite a, some time ago, a conservator telling me that another reason for flipping, and you've almost alluded to this, but another reason for flipping it front to back might be to make sure that the, um, I don't wanna say fading, but the light effects, the effect of light on it is uniform on both sides of the fabric. And I've always puzzled over, well, does one want to even out the fading effect on both sides or does one want to focus the effect and then wow. have, a, you know, a different side? Well, having seen so much damage that way, um, it is hard to recover when we're not really sure. We often, you know, sort of open that weft and look at the underside of the yarn to see what the original color was. And in a museum with, you know, an otherwise important collection, uh, an important piece that should be displayed 
from one side it often is displayed the other way because the fading is so bad. It's really about it's really really about monitoring um, and paying attention to does the sunlight hit the piece um, and is that seasonal? We know that light comes through a window at different angles at different times of the year, so it's kind of paying attention to that um, that where the sunlight comes in is it direct is it close do we have lights on all the time um, and offering our textiles a little better protection yeah and you can make those own choices for your own but a museum collection we have to preserve as best we can That's right. so um here is a, a couple on storing them. When rolling the textiles, do you recommend including a layer of unbuffered tissue between the layers? Um, not necessarily. I would say if, if a textile had um, maybe stains or deposits, I might consider that. Or more importantly, we tend to do that when there's a lot of damage and we don't want warps or uh, damaged edges to sort of entangle themselves. So it's a bit of a barrier. Um, I'm not sure that I, it's necessary for a textile that's in really pretty good condition to, to go to that length. I think it's it doesn't hurt, but I'm not sure it does anything. And here's an Arizona specific one. Would using a cedar lined closet be helpful for storing rugs and fabrics here in Arizona during the summer months? I yeah, <laughs> yeah, that won't that won't hurt. Um, there is a repellent quality. Cedar cedar chests, cedar boxes, cedar closets do not kill insects. If the insect is in there, it will survive. But it is a repellent quality that we're after, and so um, uh, I do. <laughs> I have some uh, a few pieces that I care about and have them in a in a cedar um, chest. Somebody wanted to know, are museum collections generally stored, uh, storing textiles flat or rolled? I think you've indicated that it's mainly rolled, but. Well, it depends. It depends on what the textile is. Uh, most museums that are storing, say Navajo or the Spanish colonial or the, um, the Saltillo, uh, many of these textiles, smaller pieces, no, but, and, or highly damaged pieces, no, but um, pieces that are in relatively good condition, it allows for a lot more efficiency. We can roll them, see the catalog number and have them in cabinetry, museum cabinetry, where at the State Museum, for example, we um, oftentimes have 50 rolled textiles at a time in the same cabinet. Yeah. One person was wondering what is a specific type of Velcro would you use for hanging? Does it need to be archival? No, if Velcro is um, a, a wholly synthetic material that, that in this case is, is fine. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch over. There's uh, two questions that are different than all the others. One is, could the earlier two panel text or textiles relate to wearing them as ponchos? Hmm. I am not aware of any, well, Navajo ponchos are woven as one piece. They're not woven with a seam down the middle. Um, Navajo weavers um, make, when I was talking about the weaver's line that goes diagonally, in this case, weavers make a slit where the neck hole is, and they do that um, a, in a, a single piece, single width piece. So I think we have a saltillo though that yeah, is, is yeah. Uh, designed that way to be. Absolutely, the Mexican the tradition style. that is true, and I'm thinking the Mexican tradition, not just for um, ponchos and sarapes, saltillo tradition, but backstrap weaving that makes narrow narrow. Um, strips, um, the neck holes for wipiles and for other mm -hmm. women's garments from the backstrap tradition are also made That's right. in paired um, panels. Um, I guess it's the way the question was phrased, if this is where it came from, that I'm not so sure how to answer. 
You want to re read I, that? I, I have to. I, I put it in the answered one, so I have to find it real quickly. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it, it may um, not be. Uh, I wish we were in person so I could just look the person in the eye and say, "Yeah, what could you mean that." Um, I, I think they were just musing on what how some of the panels might have. Yeah. Yes, they're upon you. Heard it. It's a, could, could the early earlier two panel textiles relate to wearing as ponchos? Sure. Yeah. Some yes, some no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, is it okay to frame smaller pieces in a frame with museum glass? Also with weaver lines, I have natural wool pieces that seem to have create it landscape by the use of lines and wool variations. Is this intentional? Uh, two totally separate questions. Right, it's, sorry, they came in the same question. So yeah. the first one, is it okay to frame smaller pieces in a frame with museum glass? Um, you, what, you, what you don't wanna do is try to have the glass touching the textile. So don't, don't let the glass be the sandwich, but there is um, framing techniques that allow for a spacer and there are ways then to, to put a textile within a frame uh, safely. But why but don't not, you want the glass on it? Not directly on the glass. And, and why is that? Why wouldn't you want the glass on it? Um, basically using then the compression of the glass. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a sometimes a, a bit of a reaction if there's any humidity in there, you'll get um, it. it You'll get a change in the glass a little bit, but you'll also start to see some um, reaction between the glass and the and the textile, um, mm -hmm. just from that that direct contact like that. Right. And then the other half of that uh, question is, uh, with weaver lines, I have natural wool pieces that seem to have created landscapes by the use of the lines and wool variations. Do you think this is intentional? That's a great question. And um, I don't know whether the pieces are historic, in which case we can't possibly read the weaver's mind and we can't know how much those um, color differentiations have become exaggerated over time. So in an historic piece that has those weaver's lines looking like landscapes, I will not speculate what the weaver saw or meant. We have brilliant contemporary uh, Navajo pieces in which, for instance, D.Y. Begay um, can wax eloquent. She's very articulate about the um, evocation of the landscape where she lives or lived and grew up. So um, then, yes, absolutely. Um, but you know, the other is kind of in the eyes of the beholder at this point. Right. So uh, this is for Anne and Nancy. Um, it says, are either of you doing research on old Zuni textiles? <laughs> well, not, Somebody I'm needs not directly to. doing that <laughs> right now. Um, as I said, most of the time things come to me because there's there's been a problem of its condition and then that leads to other questions. So unfortunately, no, but fascinated by them. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Someone needs to take that up. Leslie Spear did the classic work on defining and describing Zuni um, weaving in the early 20th century. And um, it really is warranted. It's fascinating work. I know from the database, Joe Ben Wheat's database, I don't remember now offhand how many Zuni textiles are um, included, but there are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, more than a handful, and their traits are something that someone should really follow up on. I know that a number of dealers and collectors um, have their eye on Zuni or eye out for um, Zuni textiles. They're very collectible because they're special. They're a smaller, um, lesser known group. Um, there are certain colors that we see in the native gray wools that Zuni use. It has a greenish cast to it that I associate with Zuni right away when I see it in the blanket. Um, there are all those kinds of structures that I talked about today in such broad form that we could just focus on Zuni alone and talk about. And uh, I think there'd be a lot to say. So if someone is interested in taking up that um, task, please talk to me, email me. I would be delighted to share what I do have, even though it has never been a focused study on Zuni. 
I don't know what Lori Webster has done in the Zuni area. I mean, that would be a question for her as well. Right. Okay. And the last question, because we're already after eight o'clock, um, yeah. is a whole another lecture, but um, maybe there's a word or two you could say to help this person if they want to do some research. They wanted to know about dye types over, used over time. Oh, cute. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's a whole nother lecture. Um, yeah. but, but I remember, Anne, from the exhibit we did with you, that there was a certain period when aniline dyes came in, and maybe you could just address that real quickly. Well, I, um, it's interesting. I, I almost inserted a phrase when I talked about dyes as one of the clue categories that we would address. And I was going to say it's another lecture completely. In fact, it's a whole other study. Um, yeah, the changes in dyes through time, whether it's native, natural, um, local, or um, commercial, or synthetic, I mean, all these categories. Um, is well worthy of a study. It was a major focus in Joe's work. And in Joe Ben Wheat's book, you can read a great deal about the dyes and their analysis. David Wenger is a dye analyst who did, dye chemist who did most of the um, analyses for Joe's studies. And he continues to do really um, brilliant work um, uh, identifying dyes for collectors and museums. So have I said enough? I don't know. Yeah, um, the only thing I will yeah. say is if you come to the State Museum's exhibit, you will see really prime examples of the use of cochineal for red and indigo for blue and a very prominent in the Saltillo Sarape tradition. Well, and the, the fact that the, 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 the people in Oaxaca and Zapotec have really taken to rediscovering and re-experimenting with natural dyes yeah. is so exciting. In looking at a number of dye, um, textiles, Navajo textiles, um, relatively recent, last over the last two years, um, a large collection, uh, mainly from the 20th century, it's very clear that um, dealers and traders were um, promoting certain colors as well as um, weavers finding trends that were desirable. And mm -hmm. you can see where, where and how they're using sort of new and uh, very colorful uh, dyes that aren't so popular now, but clearly went through a trend. And so there, there's, um, I think one of the things people should remember about anything that's that's handmade is that there there are trends. What's what looks good, um, you know, in 1960 no. doesn't look so good in 2020, maybe or maybe it does. Um, and so there are availability and style trends um, really do impact people everywhere. What I wanted to say was what we haven't addressed is the 19th century use uh, or appearance of dyes in um, Navajo, well, in all, all four cultures, um, and the importance of red. Um, mm -hmm. Oh gosh, we just haven't covered it today. That's what we no, need to do. It's, it's, it's a whole it's nother lecture. lecture. <laughs> uh, uh, I did a chapter in the uh, book on cochineal that the Museum of International Folk Art put out to document the use of cochineal and lac and other insect dyes and then the other reds. Um, yeah, big subject uh, and, and lots to, to say, just not fitting in here very easily. Yeah, we'll have to organize another talk.